Hello, folks. Thank you so much for the opportunity to attend and present at uh, DigiCrop 2022. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the challenges we face in developing uh, new crop varieties in the, the chase in the face of a changing environment. Uh, now, just a quick review of the, the scope of the challenge that we face. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, or may not, uh, more than half of the calories consumed by humans around the globe come from only three crops, maize, rice, and wheat. For two of those crops, uh, wheat and rice, the uh, yield, the yield, the amount of grain we can harvest from the same amount of land has largely stopped increasing in many of the most productive countries uh, over the last 30 years. This has a, a number of very negative uh, impacts. One of those uh, is on food prices and also social stability. So what you see here is the uh, FAO food price index going back over the last also about 30 years. And what you can see is that uh, after a long period of relative stability, uh, we've become more prone to, to large uh, spikes in price. Um, and these spikes have been associated with uh, social instability, riots, and, and the overthrow of governments. If you are in a country where you spend 30, 40, 50% of your daily income just feeding yourself and your family, and the price of food doubles, your back is against the wall. You have no options, and you're going to try and break the system that has put you in that position. Uh, and I will mention that we are starting to again test the, the heights of food prices uh, that we saw associated with these uh, two periods of great instability uh, in 2008 and 2011 to 13. Now I mentioned that there are three crops that provide about half of all the calories. And the third of these crops is maize. Maize uh, is uh, in some ways a, a better story. Uh, the yield uh, of corn has, of maize has continued to increase uh, strikingly linearly uh, since the around 1960. So more than uh, half a century at this point. Um, and so this yield increase of about 1.9 bushels per acre per year corresponds to about 103 kilograms per hectare per year, if I've done the conversion accurately. When I show this graph to people outside of agriculture, people in computer science, statistics, fields like that, they are always struck by this strong linear relationship and they want to know uh, what explains it. Uh, particularly because we know that it's not just that there's constant spending on uh, plant breeding. If anything, the uh, investment in plant breeding has increased dramatically uh, in recent years uh, in order to, to stay on this line. So to understand why we see this linear relationship, it's helpful to look at other fields that have similar um, uh, constant rates of growth. Uh, oh, I should also mention, uh, just to give you a sense of what a deviation from this line means, in 2012, there was a severe drought in the, uh, the US Corn Belt. Because of that, about 1.5 billions of corn were not produced uh, that we would have seen if, if yields were more on the trend line. That single drought destroyed uh, enough calories to, to feed uh, 190 million people for a year. And that was not a substantial deviation from the, the trend line, uh, or at least as substantial of one as you could envision happening uh, in a really severe year. So anyway, what causes these, these linear relationships? So uh, probably the most famous of these is uh, Moore's law, a prediction about the rate at which the number of transistors that can fit in a certain area of a, of a chip um, will grow over time. And again, there's a very nice linear relationship. And again, what we see is this constant linear relationship is associated with greater and greater degrees of spending in inflation adjusted dollars to stay on the trend line. Moore's law isn't the only example of this. Uh, so for a long period, well, not for a while, sequencing actually followed, the cost of sequencing a genome followed Moore's law. And during the period when I was a graduate student, uh, we were all feeling very happy and honestly a little bit smug that uh, sequencing was declining much more rapidly uh, than it was predicted by Moore's law. And people started fitting different uh, lines to this uh, curve, predicting that sequencing would continue to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, what we have seen is that the, there's actually been a sort of plateau with one significant additional decrease driven by the introduction of third generation sequencing technologies. So these relationships, they work and then sometimes they stop working. So yeah, predicting the future works until it doesn't. Um, developing a new crop variety takes seven to 10 years. That's important for a number of reasons. Um, but in this case, think about that as roughly equivalent to 
uh, the lead time for developing and deploying a new sequencing technology or building a, a new semiconductor uh, fabrication node. Knowing that there is a linear exponential relationship can drive industry decision making and investments. So if I am uh, running a plant breeding company, a corn breeding company, let's say, and the varieties that my breeders are saying they want to start commercializing look like they have a 15 bushel an acre uh, yield advantage over what's currently on the market, I'm going to be really worried because I can look at that linear relationship and say, well, by the time you get your varieties out 10 years from now, the, the state of the art is going to be 20 bushels an acre ahead of where it is now. So we're, we're falling behind. We need to invest more, whether it's deploying new genomic prediction technologies, testing more varieties, uh, testing more yield plots, um, firing these breeders and hiring new higher paid breeders who are better at their jobs. I don't know. Um, but staying on track gets more expensive over time because more and more often doing the same thing is going to mean we're below the trend line. So either I have to invest a lot more money in my breeding program or I decide uh, that I need to shut my breeding program down because we're not going to be competitive uh, in 10 years with what other people are doing. Uh, and there's a, a prediction uh, for this associated with Moore's law. There are actually are physical limits to how far Moore's law can advance, but um, the prediction is Moore's law is not going to end when we can't build smaller transistors. It's going to end when somebody says, I don't want to pay for smaller transistors. And I think that when we, there's a substantial risk of the, the same thing happening in plant breeding. We're already seeing industry consolidation so that there are fewer and fewer uh, companies investing uh, in, in breeding new varieties of maize or, or wheat or rice. But that's not our only problem. We have a, another problem in plant biology and plant breeding. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, developing a new crop variety takes seven to 10 years. Um, there are things you can do to speed it up a little, but it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, um, typically we're looking at a seven to 10 year time frame. The other important thing to recognize is that all of those yield increases I showed you um, for both maize and wheat and rice and for other crops uh, depend on selection conducted in the target environment. So I can't uh, take uh, yield data from here in Nebraska and say, okay, this is a really good hybrid. It's gonna do great in Italy. I can't take that data and say, this is a really good hybrid. It's gonna do great in New York. I can't even take it and uh, say, this is a really good hybrid here in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's gonna work well over in North Platte, uh, about four hours drive from here, still in Nebraska. So um, that's a, a relatively strong statement. Let me show you some data to back it up. What you see here is a comparison uh, of the yield of some of the same hybrids uh, in both Nebraska and Michigan in uh, 2018. And what you see is there are a couple of varieties that are just terrible, they do bad everywhere. But besides that, we really don't see much of a linear relationship between the performance in Nebraska and Michigan. Now, there could be a couple of things to explain this. The first is Nebraska and Michigan are actually quite far apart in the US. We have very different environments, different soils, different rainfall profiles, different growing season lengths. Uh, the other is that's a relatively small amount of data. So what if I instead compare a lot more varieties and I do something a little bit more similar? So Nebraska to Missouri, these are two states we actually border each other in the US, um, only by a small amount, but we do border. So here you see uh, data from this same large integrated uh, uh, yield testing uh, project. Here we're looking at 319 shared hybrids. And again, same two terrible varieties, but everything else really almost no relationship at all. Well, you might say that's still different states. What if we just look at you know, different trials uh, conducted within the same state? And fortunately I have that data uh, because we do conduct trials both here in Lincoln where I'm based and also in North Platte, which is a, a few hours drive uh, to the west of here. And I saw this data. So first of all, this is 2020. So this is why our two terrible variety, one of our two terrible varieties has changed. Uh, B14A, Mo17 got dropped out of the trial. Um, and I saw this data and I was first, I was really excited. We've got this one line, it was the best line in both varieties, or in both locations. It turns out this was the local check. This was commercial uh, corn bought from the, the local seed company, um, which is about 20 years more advanced than the off patent stuff that we're able to use for research purposes. So this line has benefited from 20 years more breeding and it turns out breeding does work. But uh, beyond that, we really don't see much of any relationship between the, the yields, even in two parts of the same state and Nebraska. So developing new varieties depends on being able to evaluate them in the environment uh, in which they're going to be able to be grown. 
why can't we do this? Why can't we learn how to predict in one, uh, from grow in one environment, predict how things are gonna do in another environment? Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, I'm gonna go through at least three of them in this talk. Uh, the first, which uh, I think is one of the, the less intuitive ones is, the, is Berkson's paradox, uh, which is that uh, in order for a line to be evaluated and included in these trials, because we're using off patent varieties from the seed companies, it had to do really well somewhere. Uh, the best illustration of Berkson's paradox that I've seen uh, actually has to do with uh, basketball. So if you've ever seen a basketball game, there's a, a striking difference, which is the players tend to be very tall. But if you look at the heights of basketball players and compare it to their performance uh, in the, the NBA, the Professional Basketball League, you see almost no relationship between uh, height and uh, success, a uh, number of points scored. So does that mean height doesn't matter to being a good basketball player? No, it means that all the people who are short and bad at basketball didn't get into the NBA. We're only looking at the ones who were, were successful. Um, and so, yes, um, if we have these lines down here, I mean, there's probably a lot of corn like these varieties. They're not being tested because they were never patented. They were never released by the seed companies, uh, but we do have access to them as public sector breeders. Uh, so uh, one of the data sets I'm gonna show you a little bit later in this talk actually allows us to uh, control for this effect. So this is a set of more than 750 genotypes that in a collaborative project between my lab and uh, the Thompson lab at uh, Michigan State University, we were able to, to grow with replication in two environments uh, in Michigan and Nebraska. And if you uh, include a lot of lines that are not the best in any one environment, you start to see a much better linear relationship between yield and uh, in two environments than you do using only uh, elite varieties, uh, elite crop varieties. Still not a great relationship, but it's there. The next thing to keep in mind is that there really is a lot of statistical error in the statistical sense. So not somebody made a mistake in recording the, the yield of the plants or somebody planted the wrong thing, but just if you plant 15 plots of the same crop variety right next to each other, same uniform soil, there will still be variation in the yield from one plot to another. And because we're growing hundreds or thousands of plots, they are relatively small. So there just will be a fair bit of uh, residual uh, value. One of the best illustrations uh, I can show you, this is actually work from one of my PhD students, Hong Yu Jin. So he built a statistical model to predict uh, yield in Nebraska using just uh, the Nebraska phenotypes, the Nebraska genetic data, he only used, I think, about 400,000 markers because uh, more than that didn't help and it made the prediction run more slowly. But if he looks at these predictions, which only have access to Nebraska data and are trying to predict Nebraska data using a, a simple RR blot model, those predictions are better or, or, or more correlated with yield in Michigan than the actual observed Nebraska data. So the genomic predictions outperform actual observations in making predictions across environments, which makes sense because we're borrowing information from different varieties that share common alleles at particular locations uh, in the genome. The last uh, reason that we can't predict yield across environments, which is in a lot of ways, uh, the most interesting to me as a geneticist is uh, genotype by environment interactions, which is uh, if we look at the same variety in different environments, we either have no interaction, the environment may change the overall performance or overall trait value, but the relationship between them stays the same. You could also envision though that the uh, relationship could change between environments or even the, the rank order could reverse, which would be the most extreme example of genotype by environment interaction. We can model this uh, statistically, um, particularly if we have access to data on lots and lots of genotypes across lots and lots and lots, and lots of environments. Uh, that's something that some of the big seed companies uh, have, but probably a lot of public sector plant biologists, plant breeders do not. One big and notable exception to that is the Genomes to Fields project, um, which I'm a part of, and I've been showing you some of the Genomes to Fields hybrid data earlier in this talk. Uh, what you see here is an analysis of some of the genomes to fields data, uh, about 46,000 uh, total uh, plot, yield plots of corn uh, across 77 environments um, over uh, three years. I'm showing you only two of the years here. Now, if you look at different phenotypes across different environments, you can see there are different 
proportions of the total variance explained by environment, by genotype, by G by E, and, and by residual stuff. We, we can't explain by modeling any of this. Um, but if we look specifically at yield, um, G by E explains more of the variance than genotype itself. Environment explains a lot, which makes sense. Um, if you look at this map, you know some of these environments, this is in, in Canada, this is in Georgia, this is the heart of the US Corn Belt. Um, uh, they're very different environments in terms of how much, how, how good or bad they are for growing corn. Um, uh, this is me in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, right here, and these are remote field sites. Anyway, um, this is a really big problem because we need to be testing varieties in the environments in which they will be grown in order to develop the best ones. The varieties we're developing right now will be on farmers' fields around 2030. And we don't have access to the environments of farmers' fields in 2030. Um, and we don't really have any, any other option. I mean, there, there's nothing else that can uh, match the performance of selection uh, in the target environment. Why don't we have access to the, the, the farmers' fields of 2030? Well, the, the obvious one is that temp temperatures are changing, uh, which changes the length of the growing season. It changes the amount of stress the plant's going to see in the, the middle of summer. We're also seeing rainfall patterns change, which can be uh, good or bad. If it's good, we still we need new varieties that are gonna be able to use all that extra water. If it's bad, we need new varieties that are gonna be able to um, uh, efficiently convert the limited water they have access to into the maximum amount of rain possible, even if that is less. Um, this isn't just change in climate and the environment, but also we need to think about changes in management practices, the input costs and regulation of uh, environmental impact of, uh, of agriculture is changing. Um, so we're seeing an increasing amount of regulation of fertilizer runoff. And even if we weren't seeing regulation of fertilizer runoff, simply the cost of fertilizer uh, is increasing. Um, a farmer uh, planting corn outside of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, where I am today, is probably looking at paying about three times as much for fertilizer uh, per pound or per kilogram uh, as he or she would in a, a, a a more typical year like this. And it's not clear that that's something that is going to change going forward in the future. So the farmer's probably gonna apply a lot less fertilizer. And that again is going to change the environment uh, for the corn plant and which uh, varieties uh, uh, of corn are going to, to do well in those changed environments. We know that uh, management practice also uh, dictates a lot about what are the individual phenotypes that will lead to high performance. This is uh, one of the classic examples of this uh, work by uh, Don Dubik at uh, Iowa State University, looking at hybrids developed uh, between the 1930s uh, and the turn of the century, and looking at how they performed uh, at different planting densities. Most of the increase we see in the yield of corn isn't actually from developing corn plants that produce more grain from a plant. It's developing uh, corn plants that are more okay with being packed at high density into the same field. So each plant produces the same grain, but you have more total corn plants. One of the, the things that we have learned retrospectively looking at these, these old varieties versus new varieties is that when breeders selected for, for performance at high density, one of the things they selected for was a change in leaf angle from plants that had leaves that were much more perpendicular to the stem to much more upright like this. And what this does is if a plant has a limited amount of uh, light coming in, it distributes the same amount of light over more photosynthetic tissue so less of that uh, excess light is lost because the plant is overloaded and it can't use it. It has to use things like non-photochemical quen non quenching to dissipate the light. Instead, it can capture that light. And we see a, a substantial change in the leaf angle of uh, modern uh, maize varieties versus uh, older ones. But we didn't select for this. We selected for performance under high density uh, and then figured out afterwards these were the types of things we had selected for. So uh, if we had known, we probably could have done that same selection more efficiently if we knew what are the other traits that contribute to yield in the environment that we're targeting. Uh, so can we identify other traits that contribute to yield in particular environments? Uh, what I'm showing you here is work from uh, Ravi Moral, a postdoc in my lab, and Michael Tross, a graduate student. Um, Ravi gathered data from a single maize population that had been grown for different experiments all across the US and collected lots of other traits beyond the sort of standard yield and, and flowering time uh, for this population. Michael took some of this data, uh, actually this is data from our, our own site here in, in Lincoln, 
and built a random forest model to try and predict yield from uh, uh, from other phenotypes measured from the same plants. So things that were not directly yield related. We didn't put um, 100 kernel weight or something into the model. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later how that model actually performs. But the powerful thing about random forest or really any sort of machine learning based model, one of the many powerful things about these models is we can actually look at what are the variables that contribute most to the accuracy of the predictions of the model. And what you see here is uh, uh, Michael using a permutation based method to actually estimate just from this small set of phenotypes, which were the phenotypes that were most important for predicting uh, yield and the Three that were of greatest importance were days to pollen, flowering time, uh, plant height, and branches per tassel. Now, days to pollen, I can tell you a very clear story about why that matters. Plants that flower too early, they haven't produced enough leaves. Uh, they don't capture all the sunlight they possibly could uh, over the course of the growing season, so they have less photosynthate to put into the grain. Um, plants that flower too late don't have time to complete their whole life cycle uh, before um, uh, the, the killing frost comes and their life is over. Uh, so this is a nonlinear relationship, which is why it's nice to have a, a random forest model that can capture these nonlinear relationships, but it makes a lot of sense. I can't tell you as good a story about plant height or branches per tassel, but what I can tell you is all three of these are traits that we know it is possible to phenotype using automated methods, for example, drones or, or uh, um, rovers, or even potentially satellite imagery, although I'm, I'm less convinced we can use satellites to count the branches on tassels of corn plants. I've been wrong before. So um, the other thing that Michael was able to do is take the same data from Nebraska and use it to predict uh, performance of those same varieties in another location because we're using this collaborative data generated both here in Nebraska and in uh, Michigan. So uh, as you can see, flowering time mattered much more for predicting yield in Nebraska than it did for predicting yield in Michigan. Remember, this is the, the Nebraska flowering time. And this actually makes sense. So if we look at the relationship between flowering time and yield for Nebraska, we see a much stronger and sharper relationship um, in the Nebraska data than we do in Michigan. So uh, it's always nice when you can look at the graph and get the same conclusion that the computer drew from the data. And then we see some other differences in terms of what traits uh, are important in, in Michigan versus Nebraska. So this is a very early example of how we can start to identify what are the other traits in a, uh, about a variety of corn that will predict how it will perform in one environment versus another. Now, I mentioned I was also going to show you the actual performance of these models. So this um, is uh, Hong Yu's model built based on genomic data, Michael's model based on phenomic data. Uh, and here what we're doing is looking at cross-validation predictions. We train the model on some of the data, then we test it on new genotypes that it's never seen before. And you can see in both cases, these models don't perform all that well, which is uh, is reasonable. Yield prediction is a hard thing. That's why uh, so much time and resources and, and effort goes into it. But this phenomic prediction using only a handful of relatively easy to measure traits is uh, outperforming uh, a genomic prediction model, uh, which I think is, is pretty exciting. Now, the data I showed you, I mentioned those were, were easy easy to measure traits, um, easy is relative. Uh, I'm really fortunate to, to have such an outstanding uh, field crew uh, in my lab here in Nebraska. And the data I've been showing you uh, has come primarily uh, not from automated methods, but from folks walking through fields with rulers and notebooks. But that's something that is not scalable. Uh, there are a limited number of people in the world whose idea of a good time in the summer is to be walking through a muddy cornfield as the steam comes up uh, out of the mud and you're bitten by bugs and your arms are cut by the, the razor sharp edges of the leaves of the plant. Um, so we wanna use the, those people's time as efficiently as possible. If there are things we can automate, we wanna do it. If there are ways we can build better predictions so we need less data, we also wanna do that. Um, and I'm fortunate to be part of the AI Institute for Resilient Agriculture, uh, which is developing some of these tools, both from a, a phenotyping point of view, but also from a prediction point of view. The, the core mission of the center is to develop digital twins that can predict the performance of, of actual plants uh, under field conditions. Uh, and these would be very powerful both to assist breeders uh, in making predictions about how plants will perform in unseen environments, as I've been primarily talking to you, uh, about during this uh, presentation. But the other and potentially more powerful thing is that digital twins can also assist farmers by allowing them to simulate the outcomes of 
different management uh, practices during the growing season and pick the ones that lead to the, the best outcomes for them. Um, integrating uh, not just what is the best yield, but what's the, the best economic outcome. If you spend you know, $500 on fertilizer to get uh, $200 more grain, that probably doesn't make sense. If you can get a special carbon credit for doing this, but not that, you know, all of this needs to be integrated into the model, which is why it's great that I get to work not just with engineers and computer scientists and statisticians, but even economists. Uh, economists are, are fascinating people and it's not a field you normally get to work with in my line of work. Um, I'm looking at the time over there and realizing I don't have a lot left. So I think I'm going to skip over a lot of this uh, talk about phenotyping. Uh, very briefly, so measuring leaf angle, I've told you why leaf angle important. It's very hard to do from a uh, 2D image, but we were fortunate enough to collaborate uh, with a, a professor of computer graphics, Bedridge Benz, and his uh, talented PhD student, Matthew, uh, to build a voxel carving algorithm that allows us to get 3D structures of these sorghum plants. Um, and from these 3D structures, we can do segmentation of the individual leaves measure the individual angles of these leaves in 3D space. Um, and then this is work from uh, Michael Tross in my lab, actually conduct GWAS with this data, identify genes controlling leaf angle and sorghum. Uh, sorghum has been comparatively less studied than maize, but a lot of these line up with both uh, published QTL and the orthologs of maize genes, where the genetic architecture of leaf angle has been studied in a great deal more detail. Um, there are really only a handful of labs in the public sector that can generate these uh, large, dense phenotypic data sets, whether we're talking about in the field or with the uh, high throughput phenotyping, just because of the, the resources required. So as we think about how to integrate phenomic prediction, um, make predictions across many environments, which will require data from many, many locations, we need things that are more scalable. Um, some options for these are uh, the Grow Once Phenotype Forever model. You can read more about this uh, in this uh, paper. But essentially, we can collect hyperspectral reflectance data uh, and then use that to train new models in the future, go back and be able to do GWAS or genomic prediction on trials that have already been completed. Similarly, uh, the potential for high th phenotyping using uh, satellite data, I think, is perhaps underappreciated as the resolution of this data is increasing. We can now buy data at 30 centimeter per pixel resolution, which is giving us multiple pixels even from a two, two row yield plot. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your uh, attention and for this opportunity. Um, stay safe, folks. <laughs>